And Mayor Pro Tem, you may begin. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to the joint city council meeting with our state legislators. Uh, this is a virtual joint meeting. We are streaming live on channel eight for Comcast and 880 as well for high definition Comcast. You can also watch on city of Longmont YouTube channel as well as the Longmont public media YouTube channels. At this time, I'd just like to congratulate and welcome our legislators on their, their elections and uh, and start some introductions. I'm Mayor Pro Tem Aaron Rodriguez, and let's go around with City Council. Um, chime in as you feel necessary, because you're all in different, I'm sure, orders on screens. So just just feel free, City Council, jump in. So okay, for a quick introduction. Holly Christensen, uh, Council at Large. Marsha Martin, Ward Two. Um, Mayor Pro Tem, it might be better if you would call on us because nobody knows when to chime in. I think generally speaking that the representatives and, and senator know who we are, but that's why I said it's fine just to just to jump in. But uh, sure, uh, Councilmember Waters. I was just waving to my friends there, <laughs> Karen and Sonia and, and uh, Tracy. Yeah, nice to see you all. Thanks for doing this. Okay, fair enough. This Council is Susie, Susie Hidalgo Faring, um, Ward 3 representative. Joan Pack at large. All right, we do have a number of staff members here. I see City Manager Harold Dominguez, uh, Assistant City Manager Sandra, Sandy Cedar, Sandra Cedar, uh, City Attorney Eugene May. Uh, let's see, we have Municipal Judge Robert Frick with us. Uh, let's see, uh, Director of uh, LPC, Alarmant Public, or I mean, uh, David Hornbacher. Uh, we have Public Works and Natural Resources Director slash Deputy City Manager, Dale Rademacher. And uh, we do have some clerks with us, I'm sure. <laughs> and there might be some other folks, but anyway, moving on, let's, uh, let's hear from our, our colleagues in the legislature. Mayor Pro Tem, I have in the agenda starting with Senator Hawkins Lewis. Sounds great. I was just gonna say, none of us are shy, but we, we never wanna speak over each other. <laughs> so thank you for putting us in an order. Uh, good evening, um, all my good friends and colleagues uh, on the Longmont City Council. It's always a pleasure. I look forward to our usual meetings. Uh, we're obviously coming together in a different format this year, but I just wanna commend you on how you've handled uh, the pandemic and keeping everyone safe in Longmont. You've done a fantastic job and you've handled a lot of issues this year. And um, obviously I try to stay aware of what's happening in Longmont. Um, I am a first year uh, Senator, but this will be third year serving at the Capitol. So I have just enough knowledge to get in trouble, so to speak, but hopefully represent our our community appropriately. I'm very, very happy to be with you tonight. And when it's time, would love to hear what you would, uh, concerns you have for us. And then if we have uh, the opportunity to share with you what we're working on, we have a fantastic Boulder County delegation. Um, I think the heart and soul of the Boulder County delegation is our Eastern part, which the three of us are on tonight. So, um, uh, let, let me turn it over to, uh, to one of my colleagues, but thank you for inviting us to be here. Thank you. Uh, Representative McCormick, I believe, are you next on the agenda. Great, because I don't have the agenda in front of me. <laughs> so, um, yep. Thanks, everyone. This is Karen McCormick. I represent House District 11, which is the bulk of Longmont, but not all of it and Lyons and Allens Park and Niwot. So all within Boulder County, um, very happy to be a first time legislator. And I also wanna thank each and every one of you for your service to our, our great little big town. Um, I just really love this town. I've been here for 27 years and I'm never leaving. So um, I'm, I'm all in on supporting um, everything that we can do to keep our communities uh, safe and vibrant. So yeah, I look forward to sharing uh, all the things that I'm working on and that we're working on and hearing more about what you're focused on um, this year. 
So thank you. Next up is uh, Tracy. Well, thank you. It's a hard act to follow these two wonderful legislators. Uh, I'm Tracy Burnett. I represent House District 12. It's Eastern Boulder County and includes one third of Longmont plus uh, Lafayette and Louisville, all in the Boulder County area. And again, I can't uh, emphasize enough. Uh, you guys are doing a great job. I love Longmont. I live just south outside of the city boundaries of Longmont, but I consider Longmont, I mean, I've lived here for, gosh, I think it's been 25 years. Um, Longmont's my hometown. So I just uh, really appreciate um, the opportunity to talk to you and I would love to hear um, uh, what your legislative agenda is as well. So thank you so much. Representative Burnett, I believe that you had a slide of a couple of things that were initiatives for you. Would you like for oh. us? Oh, I will dive right into those. All right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, I assume that everybody would like to know what, uh, what we legislators are doing down here. So I'll just start right off. Uh, as you probably know, um, each legislator is allowed to um, introduce five bills and I am prime on uh, five bills. I'll go over those in deep, uh, well, just in, in top level. Um, my first bill is uh, it's energy efficiency for low income and moderate income households. This is a bipartisan bill and it is providing grants and loans and doing some research for the through the division of housing that to incentivize improvements in energy efficiency for low and moderate income buildings. So I look at this as a way to incentivize landlords to reduce the energy usage of their buildings so that they do not pass those uh, util the high, you know, high utility costs on to those who can least afford it. Um, it also is doing grants and loans and research around co-locating low to moderate income housing near transit corridors, employment, education, and town centers. Again, so that these residents who can least afford it spend less on transportation, but they also reduce the uh, transportation-related pollution involved with that. Um, another part of this bill is to collaborate with other state agencies to look at um, state assets that are not being utilized and repurpose them for low and moderate income housing. So I'm very excited about this bill. My next bill is, um, uh, it's an, also a bipartisan bill and it takes care of a very small group but um, important group of people. These are people, um, there, there's, a, there's instances where parents who adopt children who receive Medicaid benefits, both medical or mental health benefits, uh, when they adopt these children, it's not always possible to, for them to get the services that they need, either because they're the, uh, maybe the mental health pr um, provider through Medicaid is far away, or it's just, it's very specialized um, uh, services. So what this bill does is under very narrow circumstances allows these adoptive parents to pay out of pocket for a non-Medicaid provider to provide the services that they think that their child needs. So it's really about helping children. My next bill, uh, this is a big one. It is to modernize regulated gas utility efficiency programs. These are gas demand side management, DSM uh, programs. And it's really focused on improving the, the natural gas efficiency of buildings. These uh, natural gas, this is um, methane, you know, it's a powerful greenhouse gas. It's used to heat our many, many residents. It's used to heat their buildings, their water, their food. And what this is, is to uh, become more energy efficient about using the, the um, natural gas in buildings. And so it's, it's there to help us meet our, you know, Colorado's um, greenhouse gas reduction goals. And it also factors into account external economic costs of burning fossil fuels, like flooding, wildfires, and the health impacts like asthma. It also takes advantage of technological advancements that improve the performance and affordability of household items like heat pumps and water heaters that we use to heat our homes in water. So my next bill is to reduce the amount of carbon and energy used to create construction materials. 
in uh, state um, in state projects. And some of you may know that it, it does take energy to produce building materials like concrete and steel. And this is aimed to um, reduce the amount of carbon used to produce those building materials, again, to help us reach our uh, Colorado's greenhouse gas reduction goals. My last bill uh, that I'm going to be introducing is basically improving the air quality along the Front Range, and it's still in the sausage making process, so I'm not going to talk a lot about it, um, but that, those are my bills. I also wanted to let you know that I am co-sponsoring two other bills that are being brought by um, other legislators. The first one is uh, very near and dear to my heart. It's about um, education, accountability, and accreditation systems audit. Um, about 10 years ago, uh, laws were put in place in Colorado that to comply with the federal statewide testing requirements. But, um, and in fact, Colorado's requirements exceed the federal requirements. But we've never gone back and audited these requirements to see, are they doing what we want them to do? Are they accurate? Are they credible? Does it, do they make sense? And also, do they have any institutional or cultural bias? So that's one bill. My last, uh, the last bill that I am co-sponsoring is um, around energy performance benchmarking for buildings. And what this is, is for certain very large buildings, 50,000 square feet or larger, it's to annually collect and report to the Colorado Energy Office, the building's energy usage and, uh, over, and, and create um, performance standards for energy usage. And over time, the, this, these standards will, will uh, increase or improve so that, again, we are focusing on reaching our uh, state greenhouse gas goals. So that's, that's it in a nutshell, um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, I do want to just note that a few of those things certainly align with what the council wanted to talk about. But before we jump into the topics that are on the agenda, I, the first thing I'm going to be sending you is a letter of support from the city council about Front Range um, Passenger Rail Commission. So before we jump into all the topics that the council would like to, 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 uh, to discuss, which are listed on the agenda, I just wanted to let Phil just take a minute so that you, he can give you some context before I send you this letter, which is really the first position um, that I'll be sending you, even though there's no bill attached. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. Um, so my name is Phil Greenwald. I'm the transportation planning manager with the city of Longmont. I've met a few of you, so it was uh, it was great to to meet you and and chat with representatives a little bit about what's going on. Um, what we have in what we are planning to send is a letter that supports Front Range Passenger Rail, but specifically, it supports the alignment that is the same as the Northwest Rail Corridor for fast tracks or for RTD. So what the letter really is asking is for you to, uh, or to, to get support for this uh, alignment, because we really think that this new alignment and this front range passenger rail group really provide the best chance for us to get passenger rail in Longmont and on that same Northwest Rail Corridor that we were promised back in 2004 with the uh, passage of fast tracks and started paying the taxes in 2005, which amount to about $5 million from city of Longmont residents per year. So uh, we've paid a lot into it, we feel, and uh, uh, we do want to get something out of out of that, that that cost. And we think that those fast tracks dollars can help supplement this front range passenger rail service. So we're asking, um, or our city council specifically is asking uh, the representatives and the senator to uh, support that alignment that is on that on that Northwest Rail corridor so we can kind of kill two birds with one stone here. So that's the letter in a nutshell and I'm happy to take any questions or I'm sure council as well. Thanks Phil and I'll be sending that letter to you after this meeting so that you have that for reference. Mayor Pro Tem, thanks for indulging me on that. We don't have any other staff presentations because these were all topics that city council uh, had put together that are on the agenda. So I turn it back over to you for that conversation. Feel free to ask anybody any questions that we have on staff um, and then, of course, I turned over to, to Mayor Pro Tem and the Council. Thank you. Do any members of Council have any questions for Representative Burnett at this time? Uh, Council Member Martin. This is really a question for everybody. Do you have um, any, any um, knowledge of when we're going to have bill numbers attached to these? Uh, because 
uh, it's much easier for us to act on them, gather up support, read them uh, when they have bill numbers and they're, and they're online. The first bills will be introduced on February 16th. That's when the first bills will be read over in third reading. So not all these bills will have bill numbers at that point, but that's, uh, and, and um, Sonia, please add. Yeah, I was uh, just gonna, thank you, uh, Representative Burnett. I was just gonna add, so there'll be uh, all representative senators designate their first bill there's a very good chance that that first bill will be introduced on the 16th, unless there's been an issue with um, finalizing the bill, like a fiscal note or something like that. Uh, and then the second and third bill, many of those bills will also be introduced uh, the same week. Uh, and so really it's kind of the order of how we've submitted those bills, um, that once they're introduced, that's when they get a number. So as Representative Burnett said, so um, they'll be kind of be, this will be an unusual year. We'll have a massive number of bills coming out that first week, uh, the 16th, 17th, 18th, and then they'll kind of come out in little batches after that. Council Member Christensen. You're muted, Polly. Yeah. You're muted again. Okay, now can you hear me? Yes, okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, this is a question for uh, Representative Burnett. I, I like all the things you're uh, working on. Um, when you mentioned the first one about uh, energy efficiency for low and moderate income households, you seem to be talking uh, mostly about landlords. I hope would hope this is for everybody who's low and moderate income. You're muted. That was that was just an example. It's for okay. any nonprofits or other, I mean, and it's just, it's some of it has to be um, matched with private funds. So it's not just landlords. I'm so glad you, you um, clarified that. Thank you. So it's for individuals too. Uh, it is for uh, organizations who apply to the Department of Housing for grants and loans. So oh. it would be, okay, so does that make sense? So it's yeah, not for but it's, so it's yeah. not for individual households. Not to my knowledge, and uh, mm -hmm. I will double check on it. The way I understand it, it is just um, is for nonprofits, government organizations, uh, um, and it is for private entities. But I don't know for individuals. So I will get back to you on that. That's a okay. very good question. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. So that would be that. That helps yeah. a lot with. Yeah, individuals but being able to afford their energy and stay in it is home. it is through the Department of Housing. Okay. So okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Through yeah through their traditional grant and loan program, it's realigning their grant and loan program for okay. uh, to be on energy efficiency. Okay. Thank okay. you. Uh, Council Member Peck. Thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. So Tracy, uh, Representative Burnett, I, uh, I really like this idea, but I'm wondering in this, in this bill and this loan program, is there any way that it is, the loans could be uh, a revolving, how do I say this? What I'm, what I'm finding in our city and with some of the low income people is that they don't through credit scores uh, they don't qualify for loans in the traditional manner. So getting a grant uh, still would not allow them to apply for a loan. M what I've been wondering about is there is a program that would be uh, a loan to an organization, whereas that loan money would be a revolving account for the low income person to borrow from that account and pay it back to that account instead of going back trying to go to a traditional lending institution, because that is where the hang up is a lot of times for people to get out of poverty. They can't, they have no door. So if that can be looked at, I, that would really be appreciated. Thanks. 
Sorry, I didn't know it was Milton. Uh, thank you so much, um, Councilman Peck. I appreciate that. Uh, Councilmember Martin, did you still have a question? No, no, it was it was answered. I, I thought so. I just wanted to confirm. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Waters. Are we limited to questions for Representative Burnett right now? <laughs> well, we're going to move on to uh, Councilmember McCormick, if that's okay. Well, I'm just not certain what our protocol is because I, I am, I'm real curious. Uh, I had about when bill numbers are assigned, but I know Senator Lewis is is the primary sponsor on a fix 06. I'm not, I don't know how else to refer to it, uh, the repeal of legislation and then to take a couple of steps to enfranchise a large number of Coloradans. Uh, who currently are not eligible for financial assistance, business licenses, uh, business permits, and um, and what's the status, and uh, what would she, what would you need, Senator, from councils, commissioners, others to help advance cause on this bill? Okay, for the sake of the question, we'll, uh, Senator Hawkes Lewis can go next, and then we'll have Representative McCormick after that. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that, uh, Karen. <laughs> um, so I apologize, but we sent a slide late to Sandy. I don't know, Sandy, it might be at the top of your inbox if you want to display it while I'm talking. I'm totally fine about that. I can go ahead and answer uh, Councilman Waters' question. Uh, if you can't find it, though, it's totally fine. Um, so I think I'll start with that bill first. I have to bring up my list here because I have like my colleagues, I have so many bills. Um, uh, so this, uh, the session, I, I would categorize my bills to fall within healthcare, environmental, community safety, and um, immigrant rights. Uh, the bill in particular that uh, Councilman Waters is talking about is, ah, thank you so much. That was, you are fast, that's amazing. Um, uh, that is actually the fourth category. Uh, so I have two bills that fall into um, immigrant rights, but the main one that Tim was asking about is repealing. It's a combination of repealing. In 2006, there was a special session that was held uh, at the Capitol where they passed, I believe it was 10 bills that dealt with uh, immigrant uh, issues and two of those are just having a devastating impact on our immigrant community uh, now, especially with COVID. The first one was, if you those of folks that are following along, if you wanted to look it up sometime, it's House Bill 06S1009, and it basically said if you are uh, not a, uh, a quote unquote legal resident, and, and they use different terminology back then, we prefer to say undocumented uh, resident now, uh, that you cannot apply for an occupational or professional license. And in the day uh, and time of COVID, we have DACA students that are graduating nursing school, other professional schools that cannot practice here in Colorado because of this one law. We have folks that want to reach out and serve the community. Child care is a huge issue where we have child care folks that want to offer services and they can't get the proper certification. They can't get the licenses because of this one law. So um, part of my bill will, will change that, fix that. Uh, the other piece will allow for nonprofits in Colorado to be able to offer certain benefits to immigrant families, um, because as we know, immigrant families are hardworking folk and they are paying their taxes and they cannot participate in services that are being offered by nonprofits in our community. And this law will address that. Also, it's a huge priority for uh, almost mun every mun municipality in Boulder County uh, and, and the city. Uh, so it's it's something that's near and dear to my heart as being a member, uh, the first elected Latina from Boulder County to the Capitol, and um, it's something that we've we've just got to do. And so that bill will be coming up um, uh, pretty near the beginning of the uh, the session, I believe. 
you want you want, I can keep going or I can stop and have questions on on the bills totally I'm very flexible I, I can't quite see everyone oh there we go <laughs> ah, I think Polly was raising yes yes council member Christensen please thank you ah, okay uh, <laughs> Sonia I um, um, could you explain a little bit more about your um, gun violence prevention measures? Thank you so much for asking that. Um, and I just want to note and Representative Burnett and Representative McCormick know that we've had a tragedy in our district and in, in Senate District 17 today. We had a shooting at Legacy uh, Senior Living Center in Lafayette. Uh, it personally uh, had an emotional impact for me and many others, my my wife is a hospice nurse and she works with the woman who lost her husband today and the um, daughter of the gentleman who was murdered was I was helping her, assist her to get into a internship program where I was hoping she would uh, would get in and then apply to be an intern at my office next year. Mm -hmm. This is a total tragedy and this just happens way too often. So you're, you're catching me on, on an emotional day, but I will tell you that, that we have several bills that will be addressing keeping the community safe and reducing gun violence prevention. My first bill is the, it's known as the lost or stolen bill. Um, it is a simple, responsible gun ownership bill. Uh, if you own a firearm uh, and you don't know where it is, we need for you to report that. That's basically what it is. Uh, you'll have five days to report it is what's in the bill draft now. We have 14 other states in the country that have such a, such a bill. Um, so it's basically about edu educating firearm owners and uh, they need to know where their firearm is at all times. And if it becomes lost or stolen, then we need to report it. We had um, five teenagers in one month in Denver all killed by stolen weapons. Uh, we also had the woman, very notorious case, and I apologize, I can't remember her name right now, but she was killed walking her dog because a man had stolen an assault weapon from a Denver police officer. The Denver police officer did not report that the weapon was missing, and that gentleman used that weapon to kill that woman. So if we, we believe that we can prevent suicides and reduce community violence if, if gun owners and, and folks would know where their, where their weapon is, whether it's in their car needs to be secured, whether it's in their home needs to be secured, they need to know where their weapon is. So thank you for asking. Um, I appreciate it, Polly. And um, there's a couple of other bills coming up. I won't take time to, to talk about those. Uh, unless you're really interested, but uh, this is a huge issue for our community. We know that, and we want to do something to reduce this kind of uh, firearm violence. Well, thank you for sponsoring that. Councilmember Peck. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tim. Senator uh, Wachez, um Lewis, do you have, do you think you have by, by, uh, I can't even say it. Do you think you have support for these bills? I know that whenever gun uh, bills come up, we always have so many people come out. Thank goodness you're having Zoom now because we won't have people on the uh, Capitol steps and riots uh, at the Capitol over this. Um, but what do you think about the support for it to actually pass? Well, I, if I remember correctly, we did have bipartisan ship um, votes for ERPO, that was the red flag bill that was passed in 2019. Uh, we, we know that we'll have the support of law enforcement on many of our gun violence prevention bills. And uh, so I, I believe that we will. Uh, I do not have uh, bipartisanship on the, the main sponsorship of the bill, but we have had interest from other co-sponsors for the bill. And I, I think that that leadership and legislators realize that there's not a community in Colorado that hasn't been impacted by teenage suicide or family uh, domestic violence situations or all the things that are associated with firearms. And, and really our efforts, to be honest, are about 
let's let's be responsible gun owners. And so I think we will get to that point where we can have bipartisan uh, support. But thank you for asking that. I appreciate it. Sure. Let us know how we can help get that word out to, to uh, support all of your bills. Thank you. I can keep going on the slide or I can give my colleague a, a chance to to chime in and we can come back on however you'd like to proceed. Uh, Senator, how much more do you think you you have on the slide that you'd like to talk about? Uh, let me talk a little bit about the health care bill, I think, um, or several of those. Um, yep. And then if you have questions, you, you see the other ones. Um, we know that before COVID hit, the number one issue in America and in Colorado was um, affordable health care and, and also lowering prescription drug prices. Uh, Colorado's falling behind other states when it comes to, to work on prescription drug pricing. I passed uh, along with some help with the governor's office and other folks, the drug importation from Canada bill, but we didn't get the waiver from the previous federal administration. So the next step, and, and several states are looking at doing this, is establishing a drug affordability board, which will evaluate if drugs are affordable or not. Uh, this will absolutely reduce uh, drug prices for Coloradans and could have an immediate impact. Uh, we believe it's an excellent way uh, to finally allow uh, Colorado to basically try to get a handle on these ever escalating skyrocketing drug prices. And as the, the first and only pharmacist over there at the Gold Dome, um, it's, it's what I've spent my career working on. There isn't a week that would go by when I was a pharmacist practicing uh, in the community where someone wouldn't come in to the pharmacy and say, I can afford my groceries or I can afford one or two of these drugs you have to help me figure out which one it is. It's it's a shame, it's an absolute travesty that America is in a situation where we can't do something about um, these ever increasing drug prices. So uh, this bill will take very strong action to do that. Um, so I'll stop there, but there's several other things. And then I'm, I also wanna mention, I am so proud and honored to be on a bill as the Senate sponsor that Representative Burnett uh, talked about, and I think uh, Representative McCormick is gonna talk about a bill and she asked me to be a, a sponsor with her on a bill. So it is a total team effort here and I, I love that. Uh, so I'll stop there and, and let my colleague have a, a chance to chime in. All righty, uh, let's move on. Uh, Representative McCormick, time is yours. Thank you so much. and. Um, Sandy, I also just sent you a slide, but you don't need to use it because I'm, I'm glad to just talk about um, some of the big picture, uh, you know, high level look at the bills that I am running. And I'm really happy to say that many of these bills actually came from constituents. And one of them is one that my uh, predecessor, Representative Singer was working on, and I really loved the idea. Hang on a second. I'm sitting in front of a space heater and it's very dry. <laughs> um, so just briefly, I'll go through um, the five that I'm working on. And the first one that Senator Hawkins Lewis mentioned was a school district internet service provision. And this was brought to me by the St. Vrain Valley School District as a way to clarify a 2005 law that allows um, government districts to have their own internal internet service when they are using it for intergovernmental purposes. Man, this is bad. Um, <laughs> and it is a way for um, not only our school district, but those across the state to expand the ability of their, I'm gonna turn this off. Expand the ability of their own internal internet service to reach internet deserts um, where students do not have access to service and also to reach students that are in 
um, low income housing or houses that can't afford even the discounted rate that they may be getting from a public provider. So um, this goes, this bill will actually just clarify the language of that bill. We're not changing the bill in any way. We're not trying to compete with the public internet providers. <coughs> and um, it really is just to be explicitly clear that school districts are a government district and are allowed to do this. The um, Representative next, Mick, yeah. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Um, this, this slide needs a, a, an access. So I don't know if you wanna take a, a moment to be able to drink some water and maybe give me access to the slide. I know, I don't know what's happening to my throat, but I think it's a space heater I've been sitting in front of, hang on. If you change the permission to open, then I could open that up for you. If it's a named user, we'd have to do it by email. It's our voice behind the curtain. I'll just, I'll just keep talking. Okay, all right. That's okay. <coughs> okay. Um, the next two are under the healthcare realm because um, it's a big reason why I ran as well. I actually have a, a third one. One has to do with access to a type of radiation therapy for cancer patients that um, is called proton beam therapy. And it is used in um, certain cancers and certain conditions, especially young kids as a preferable method to traditional radiation therapy um, that uses photons. And um, it's preferred in some cases uh, because it causes uh, less damage to surrounding tissue um, and consequently less long-term cost in follow-up care when you have radiation damage to surrounding tissue. Um, and this was, this was a constituent um, brought this bill and it's really not a mandate for insurance companies, but instead it is to address the fact that some of these patients have been denied coverage under the wording of that this therapy is experimental or um, investigational and it's been FDA approved since 1988, so over three decades. Um, and so we're really just trying to remove that wording from denials to open up the ability for patients to at least explore this as an option for cancer treatment. Um, I have another one that was brought to me by a um, woman out of Allens Park that is a um, brand new graduate from a um, direct in entry nurse practitioner program. And our state is one of four states in the nation that um, does not have a um, provision in um, the, 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 the nursing code to allow these um, graduates to get their provisional prescriptive license right away. Um, and these uh, 11 schools nationwide uh, graduate um, some of the, the highest quality, um, highest scoring nurse practitioners in the nation. So these are these are students coming from very high quality schools. And so we're, we're looking to amend um, the, the, uh, uh, the Board of Nursing um, uh, uh, description to include these students because they've kind of been left out and consequently the state of Colorado is causing these high quality nurse practitioners to leave the state um, to get experience elsewhere and then come back here. We just can't afford to be losing any healthcare um, professionals uh, now or, or ever. Um, how much time do I have? I um, am also working on a bill uh, that kind of expands on what Senator Jaquez Lewis did in the past for our state to be ready for um, expansion of the Canadian Drug Importation Program for when um, other, so when other countries are also allowed that we'll be ready as a state um, and we need to uh, set that up um, under in state statutes so that we're ready when that, when we get the permission from the federal government. And I was always a, a big supporter of that bill that Senator Hawkins Lewis ran and I'm glad to, to expand that out. I'm working on an agricultural bill that will help um, set up a soil health program under the Department of Agriculture. Um, this is a bill that is by agriculture for agriculture. So this is not us telling farmers 
how or, or what to do. It is really after a year and a half of, of um, getting information from farmers and ranchers all over our state and CSU's extension office on um, being able to look at agriculture, um, the health of our soil for the future, how we can be more um, climate resistant and also play a role in um, uh, uh, sequestering carbon um, and just having, having a, a more robust uh, program that will work in partnership with our, our ag producers across the state. Um, let's see. I think that's it for now. There's more, there's more, but I'll, I'll stop for a minute, especially since my voice came back, so yeah. All righty, uh, do we have any questions at this time? Not seeing any, I would just like to take a moment since I don't know if all of our legislators and council members uh, are looking at the agenda right now, but we would be moving on to city council topics, which include in order on the agenda, housing, renewable energy, policing, equity, and local control. So I'm not exactly sure what was envisioned for this portion as far as maybe any council members having a specific item they'd like to discuss? Is that what we were kind of looking for, Sandy? These were when I uh, asked folks what they would like to talk about on the agenda. These were the topics that uh, that came back from the council. I know we don't have a whole lot of time and Mayor Pro Tem, we do want to still open yeah. public to be heard at some point there, kind of at the end. So hopefully before everyone has to leave so that they can hear if there's, if there's public input. So it looks like Miss, uh, like uh, council members. Yes. And I would just like to, to suggest uh, as an additional topic that was not listed, um, transportation slash transportation infrastructure would be a good one also, if our representatives and senator have anything to say on that. Uh, but first, Council Member Christensen had her hand up, so I believe she has something. Okay, um, so uh, as we all know, about 50% of people in Boulder County are cost burdened in terms of housing. And about 30% of us are severely cost burdened. So it's a, it is really a huge problem um, for us to deal with. Um, one of the problems statewide is that ALEC and other places, uh, entities like Casey and the Metro Home Builders and various other places have placed um, a state preemption on rent control. And that was taken in the Telluride decision to mean that, well, every, every municipality that tries to put through an affordable, affordable housing ordinance is threatened with all kinds of stuff. And we have to write around that because of the Telluride decision. And I know that for several years, they have been trying to remove rent control. And for several more years, they've been trying to at least uh, um, have the Telluride decision viewed as not impacting rental housing. So I, I would, <laughs> really like to see all of you support uh, passing that this year. Um, I believe Aaron's cousin has been leading the <laughs> charge for that. And um, it's, it's very, very important to, Boulder County has been trying to get um, affordable housing ordinances passed. We've mostly gotten a, a lot of 12% things in Longmont and in many other places, it's even more. And it would be essential for the state to actually pass that this year. Um, so I would just plead with you to urge your colleagues to vote for that. I, I could chime in just to say that um, I know that the Latinx caucus at the Capitol is very much behind the efforts of representative Gonzalez Gutierrez and Senator yes. Gonzalez, um, they, and I know Senator Rodriguez is uh, certainly um, helping us with all of these efforts around 
doing what we can to mitigate that court case um, in Telluride. There's also going to be an effort to deal with uh, eviction uh, late fees. Obviously, late fees are a huge problem right now, um, and the deadlines are very confusing to people. You had an extension uh, to protect folks on the federal side, but you know there's, they're confused about what's happening with state rules. So I think housing is going to continue to be an important category for us as we deal with uh, the COVID impact bills, and those should be coming up towards the beginning of the session. And right. I see my my good friend and constituent, uh, uh, City Councilwoman uh, Martin has a question. Thank you, Sonia. Um, on a, a, a related topic, um, Colorado does not have very much in the way of, of tenants' rights. Uh, and it would be good to see those strengthened um, regardless of who's running the bill. And I also just wanted to ask whether you folks, any of you have any insi inside information on what the governor's office is doing with regard to evictions because it is really up in the air and nobody knows. Yeah, well, I think, uh, you know, I, I love working with Governor Polis and I've certainly worked on many initiatives with him. I think he was a little bit saved by the bell on the uh, the federal administration, you know, extending the eviction uh, moratorium. Um, but the late fees again, if, if I, when it comes to housing, that's one of the biggest topics that I hear from constituents on is that, you know, if I didn't have to worry about these late fees, I could probably catch up on the rent payments and when I finally get my unemployment check and my back you know, pay, um, I could probably make it, but the late fees are gonna make me have to you know, leave or arrange for other housing. So I know that there's going to be a bill coming about those late fees. I don't know what the governor has planned beyond the two additional months that we have for eviction moratorium. We're looking at trying to construct some things around tenant rights. Um, we did a, a we chipped away a little bit at this um, because we we established um, some legal funds for folks to be able to get educated about how and also the ability to negotiate with their landlord. Uh, many folks didn't know how to do that, and we now have uh, helped nonprofits in. Uh, around the state that are helping renters do that. We know that we're looking at the fees that are being charged when they try to apply to get into rental. Um, so there's there's all these buckets of it, but I absolutely, the special session, sh I think sh showed a lot of people that housing is right there. It was one of the top four issues. And, and as far as I know, we're gonna continue to focus on it. I, I hope that you know, eases your concerns some, but we, we do have more work to do, no doubt about it. No, that's, I didn't know any of those were underway, so thank you. Councilmember Peck. Thank you. Um, again, the housing topic. You know, years ago, HUD used to uh, finance a housing for cities so that cities themselves could build housing and not, and not actually have a developer come to them um, is there any way through the state we could have funding or loans to from the state to cities who would like to build on city owned property um, or, or housing authority property? Uh, because when we go the other route and have developers come in and want to develop affordable housing on private property, there are so many hoops to jump through. There's so many ways to get around building what we actually need in the AMI that we need it. Um, so if, if that could be looked at as to how the state could help cities themselves fund housing on city property, that would be great. I love that idea. <laughs> yeah, if that's, uh, if that's a uh, dream that we could help become a reality. I think uh, that would help cut back on costs and also give more control to, um, to, to, to make sure that people can get into housing 
um, and not be taken advantage of when it's when it's city built and yeah. I I love the idea too. Um, I can tell you that idea sort of was behind a bill that I co-sponsored in 2019. So we identified state properties all, all across Colorado. And the bill, because we were worried about the funding mechanism of how to do the grants and things for cities, uh, the, the bill actually identified state properties that we could give to cities and local municipalities and nonprofits. They were state properties that were not being used anymore in the, like, you know, could, could have been an armory or, or something that the state used to use. Um, I know that bill passed and they were looking at a funding mechanism on what to do next. Um, so I, I'm with Representative McCormick and I'm sure Representative Burnett is, feels the same way, although I don't wanna put words in your mouth, but I think we should take this idea back and see you know, obviously fiscal will be the number one, but are there any other issues around that? Um, I, I just like to just pipe in that I think the state, I mean, I've been listening to a lot of um, presentations from state agencies. We're, um, we're gonna come out of this pandemic um, thinking of different ways for the state to work, for state employees to work. And I, um, and I think this is part of the one bill I was talking about. I think we will see a reimagining of the workforce, the state workforce and, um, and assets available. So that is part of my bill, but you bring it, um, um, Councilman Peck, you bring, it, uh, uh, you bring a new angle to that. So I do appreciate that. Well, and, and if I could just uh, go a little further on the funding uh, aspect of it, rather than a grant, it, would it be possible to have a revolving fund right. loan so that when the city pays back, the, the, they don't have to go out and bond for the difference. They don't, mm -hmm. um, but they can pay back into the fund what they owe so that that could go to some other project. And um, it would be a continuing funding source. <laughs> okay. Uh just for the sake of time, Council Member Waters has a, a question. Then after Council Member Waters' question, we're going to have to open this up for the public comment that's also noted on the agenda. But first, Council Member Waters, please. Thanks, Mayor Pro Tem. And I'm, and I'm, I'm gonna have to log off for that. I apologize, I'd made that clear earlier. And I don't know um, for our representatives and, and Senator Lewis, whether this is legislative, but, but several of the topics that were just mentioned, whether it's whether it's evictions and late fees, um, how uh, new forms of work and what we're learning, uh, whether it's state employees or county or city employees, um, uh, there's a lot that we ought to be learning uh, through this pandemic experience that we've been living with for the last 10 years. Where The examples of where government has done well in serving the people we're obligated to serve and where we haven't, whether it's communication, policy, um, uh, uh, gaps. And I, uh, I, I, I just wonder um, uh, how much learning we will do as elected officials in Colorado, or at least in Boulder County. What are we gonna learn is, through this experience? And how do we codify what we've learned? And, and, and how much of that might translate into legislation? How much of it might translate into ordinance? how much of it might translate into policies for school boards or others from employment to healthcare to housing. You know, there's a, a broad range. And I have, I, one of my fears is that we're gonna come out of this pandemic and we're gonna fail to learn lessons that should be learned and never forgotten about what, how we at this level, at the county level and at your level, we better serve the people that we have an obligation to serve. So. If that didn't happen anywhere else in the country, it could happen in Boulder County because of you three and what we and, and the fact that we have you know a great group of, of county commissioners. And if we could reach out to other city councils, if no one else did, we ought to do a, some kind of a commission just for ourselves and what we owe our public to, to, to benefit from what there is to learn, to translate it into what we're going to do moving forward. So if we ever experience this again or versions of it, we are better at serving those people who deserve the best from us. I have to log off. <laughs> do you? Do we have time to 
talk about that or do you want uh, so, some quick responses and then we'll have to go to opening up the public comment okay well i know that um that uh councilman waters and i have had some brief discussions about this in a different format but i couldn't agree more the silver linings if there is any from covid the tremendous loss of life the impact on families the silver lining is focusing on health if you have your health, you have everything. I think we've seen that um, a federal plan, if that wasn't gonna be there, then we have to have leadership from where we can get it. I think Governor Polis did a fantastic job taking the reins where he could. Um, obviously it was hard to get a vaccine into a state unless that's done federally. It's hard to get PPE. We're not a big producer of PPE, but I think he did a good job, but, but it shows health disparities in our community. We have so many communities where they do not have access to affordable health care, and we are starting to address that. Uh, I, along with my colleagues, are putting together, I've had meetings with Salud here in Longmont. We're going to have the first pop-up vaccination clinic through Salud. I'm lining up pharmacists, vaccinators. We're going to reach out to people that have been neglected in our community for many years. They don't have a strong relationship with a provider or a hospital. And we know that we can utilize pharmacists and other healthcare workers to reach out. And if we get people thinking about their health, maybe we can establish those improvements in healthcare. And then I'll let Representative McCormick talk about everything we've learned about look what uh, families and, and uh, uh, folks have learned about what a tremendous service teachers give our community when you see people having to be the teacher in their home now and, and all of that. But Rep McCormick's doing a wonderful job with her bill and I could go on and on. So I'll stop and let, let my colleagues chime in. I think it's time for public questions, but yeah, I think there's a lot we can learn and you're right, especially from um, educators on um, how they managed to get through and continue to manage and um, how we can be better prepared for the next, next pandemic because another one's coming. So we need to learn, we have to learn from this experience and um, we have to carry those lessons forward. So let's go with the public questions. Yes, uh, thank you very much. At this time, we will be opening up the uh, meeting for public invited to be heard. Uh, the screen has come up. You can feel, uh, please dial in at 1-888-788-0099. Once again, 1-888-788-0099. When prompted, enter the meeting ID 892-4671-0121. Again, when prompted, enter the meeting ID 892-4671-0121. And for the when they when you are asked for the participant ID, please press the pound sign. It may take a, a few seconds or so to to uh, access, and we will put you in the waiting room. So we're going to take probably about three minute break or so to allow folks to call in, and we will be right back.
right, folks, I'm going to go ahead and drop the slide and we will give our live stream just a few seconds here to get caught up. We currently do not have at this moment any callers, but as soon as the slide catches up with us on the live stream, we can continue. So we're not becoming viral tonight, I assume. <laughs> <laughs> nope. <laughs> We don't know how many people are watching on channel eight, but I think Susan said there were six on the live stream. <laughs> we are now up to eight, <laughs> um, but that's just on our channel. Could be more elsewhere. Um, and it looks like we are back on the live stream. Mayor Pro Tem, you can continue. All right, thank you. At this time, it does not appear that anybody has called in for public invited to be heard. So we, I did see a question being uh, posed by, or. Uh, Council member Hidalgo Faring. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, question, comment. You know what? And actually, I would love to catch up with the three of you. Um, you know, I have a lot of discussion. We're, at, you know, at least in the education realm, we're getting ready to prep our um, lobby days for the um, district and the state association. Um, you know, as I was looking through and reading the bills and um, and even our priorities around housing, renewable energy, policing, um, healthcare. You know, when I we think about equity, equity is should not be a separate issue, but it really needs to be embedded into all the issues. And so, you know, in looking at, I know I do this in in my classroom. I've educated other teachers um, around cultural responsiveness and really looking at taking an equity assessment. So it, throughout, you know, in the curriculum. So when we look at policy and our practices, what type of equity assessment and data collection, I don't know, that is really annoying. My dog is playing with it. <laughs> Just stop. <laughs> Sorry, how, <laughs> I can't even think straight. Um, it's like my students all day. <laughs> oh, good Lord. Is it Friday yet? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, um, so what kinds of data um, collection around equity, um, you know, are you familiar with? Are you planning on implementing? You know, if you want to sit down and have a conversation around, you know, appropriate questions to ask as we look at specific policies and practices. You know, are we just perpetuating the same um, oppressive or um, biased policies, systems, or are we really looking to dismantle and change these systems um, through a racial justice and equity lens? Go ahead, yeah. <laughs> um, Representative Burnett. Yeah, I don't think she can unmute. There we go. I'm, I am so glad you brought that up, okay. Councilman uh, Hidalgo Farron. Um, every single bill I look at is through equity lens. It's not a separate thing. My uh, gas demand side management has a, a um, clause to help people who are low income residents move, uh, you know move to um, um, or improve the energy efficiency of the gas that they use in their house. Um, the education audit bill that I'm co-sponsoring, same thing, it's looking at that. So I, I'm so glad you brought that up. This is the way I legislate is everything has an equity lens. It's not separate, so thank you. Susie, uh, I'll, I'll give a quick answer on that. We, we believe the same thing. I think in 2019, when we passed over 500 bills with over 92% bipartisan, one of those bills, I'm so proud to be a co-sponsor on, it was a bill that when we passed legislation, that a certain percent of the legislation would be looked at based on equity. So the demographics, who would be impacted in Colorado by that bill? And it's actually a report that comes out um, by legislative services when we pass, not, not every bill, but on, on a lot of them. And I think you're right. I think if we could, as legislators, 
keep equity in when even when we're thinking about anything, you know, if if I'm running a protect the pollinator bill, there's still a component of that because you're looking at um, what do we do to protect neighborhoods so that we can have pollinators in neighborhoods, you know, right? All neighborhoods. So I'm absolutely, I agree, couldn't agree with you more. Sometimes it's just, it's there, but we, we don't give it enough targeted effort when we're writing it, or, or maybe we we're worried about the fiscal note or whatever, but I, I couldn't agree with you more. Thank you for bringing it up. And I think Sandy, did you, were you raising your hand, Sandy? Yes, I did also just want to mention that I had heard some rumors that there might be some bills that are going to undo some of the things from the special session of 06, um, things like the illegal alien certification and, you know, other other pieces. So I hope that that is true. Um, certainly from from our standpoint, I hope that that's true. But that's the other thing I wanted just to point out when that was on the agenda is that we're hoping to see some of those disappear. It'd be great. Yeah. Well, those, that's the first bill I talked about was repealing, basically reversing 1023 and 1009. Perfect. Yeah, and I just wanted to say that um, listening to you, Councilwoman Hildago Faring, that um, not only should we think about it, but I think it's important to actually voice it like you just did that we have this as part of our everyday uh, conversation because just thinking about it in a silo doesn't help really um, spread the conversation as it should be on, on so many levels. So I appreciate you bringing it up. All right, I know that we're running towards the end of the meeting and there's a number of folks that need to jump to other meetings. First of all, I would like to say, uh, I'm no historian on, on the matter, but I feel like it's probably fairly unique and, and unheralded that we have all three of our legislators representatives, three strong women. And I think that's very wonderful, uh, especially for Boulder County. Um, and at the, uh, so it says that we have comments. And so I just like to allow our, our three legislators to make any final comments they'd like before we end the meeting. Any, any, anybody I'll, wish to go? Sorry. I'll just go very quickly. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I, I'll just say that Boulder County has had the, the proud tradition and history of leading progressive issues at the Capitol. And that I think you've heard from our comments tonight that we want to continue that tradition. Um, we do, all, all three of us have open door policies. We meet with our constituents all the time. Uh, I, I try to have at least one community meeting on Zoom every single day. It's hard and in session, it's probably next to impossible, but we try. We meet with our the Boulder County staff. Uh, I meet with them every single week and so, I, I want you to know that that you can always reach out to us and that that we will be there to respond. And um, we're just really honored to be serving. I keep saying we because I, I should let my colleagues speak, but uh, we all text each other and talk to each other every day. And uh, and so it's a wonderful relationship that we've established uh, for for Boulder County and Eastern Boulder County in particular. Yes, that um, open door policy, open Zoom, open phone, open email. Um, it's important to um, continue to hear from city council and also to reach out to you with our pieces of legislation. Yes, because I'm very interested in getting your feedback, your opinion, your support of letting me know what's what could be better, how, how to make it better. So. Um, Please help me and um, I'm there to help you as well to, to work for our city. So I really appreciate you putting this meeting together today and look forward to seeing you next time. And I just have to say thank you to all of you. Uh, one of the things I learned from uh, Senator Mike Foote is some of the best ideas come from constituents. And I also have said for a long time, I think change happens at the grass grassroots, the community and the state level, and we all have to work together to make it happen. So I look at all of you and the people listening here as partners 
And again, my, my door is open. I love hearing ideas. I, um, so keep, keep those comments uh, and questions coming. Thank you. Thank you all so much uh, for, for joining us. I know it's usually just a once a year thing, but uh, you know, more communication won't hurt anybody. And uh, I'm sure as the bills start to hit committee, uh, you'll be hitting, hearing a little bit more from at least Sandy, <laughs> if not some of our other council members. Um, and again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, at this time, I, I'd like to uh, move to adjourn the meeting. Second. And thanks. <laughs> all right, all in favor of adjournment, say aye. 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 All right. All opposed, say nay. We are adjourned. Thank you so much. Have a great night, everyone.